Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're really pleased to have Christopher Lee with us, Dr. Christopher Lee um, from Georgia Tech. It's um, good to have you here. I've heard a lot about you. Deborah always speaks about you in very glowing terms. I'm, I'm particularly interested as a, a fellow dyslexic to hear about your, your story and, and how you've managed to create a very successful career and, and also what you're doing with AMAC because um, Georgia Tech does some amazing stuff in terms of research into accessibility and, and not, not just in terms of web accessibility but I've seen the work that you've done on terminals and, and shopping carts and, and you know, really thinking about how you can enable people in society so um, welcome, uh, it's really great to have you on Access Chat. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Okay, so um, perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about your your personal journey and 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 your your experience of dyslexia and 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 how you've managed to you know overcome the the difficulties that that presents and uh, and and become very successful. Well, I don't know if I could say overcome, but I've been able to get around. <laughs> yeah, coping <laughs> and, and We only have thirty minutes, so yeah. yes. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, thank you for the question. I, I appreciate it. Um, I was diagnosed in the second grade, um, and back in the U.S., they called dyslexia, learning disabilities, they called it minimal brain damage. That was the label which they gave you. And um, my parents struggled to know why I couldn't read, and they struggled to know why I couldn't write. Um, and so they pulled me out of the public school system in the U.S., and they put me into a special school. And the school, you know, I was able to be picked up in front of my house in a smaller bus with the people with all I, – I reflect a lot on the second and third grade. Um, I met people who were, who were blind or visually impaired, um, first person that, using a wheelchair. Um, and and it, was, it was a good time. My first, uh, my first girlfriend, actually, back in the day was uh, in the second grade, if you could say girlfriend, was, um, <laughs> was a, an individual who, who was deaf. Her name was Janet, and she had long brown hair, and she pulled up in a ponytail. And we became great friends that, that, that year in the second grade. And I don't know how because I didn't know sign language. Um, but I, I do recall that time being um, a very serious time for me because I didn't know why I was taken away from all my friends and why I was put in this special school. And um, I remember feeling not real smart, feeling kind of stupid at that time. But I got through the second grade, and I, I, I did the best I could, but I ended up failing it. Um, and I, was, I had to repeat the second grade, and then parents put me back into the public school sector. And my speech, I was always having issues with my speech. I, was a, um, I spoke, I began speaking very late, almost three years old, actually. And um, so not only was I being taken out of academic, for academic issues, to trailers in the back of the school, which were trying to help me learn, um, and um, I was also taken out for speech issues um, because my, my, I wasn't pronouncing my R's the correct way, and no one really could understand me. They always thought I was from another country, which I loved. <laughs> I, played on that. I played on that a little bit. <laughs> I got Ireland there, <laughs> Australia. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, it, it, was, it was a time that I, I was trying to figure out what was going on inside my, my brain, and, um, and the teachers were trying to do the same thing. And the research wasn't real good with learning disabilities back then. And so I went all the way through um, – to really the fifth grade until I got involved in activity, and this was a sport that for the first time I had something to pull, something positive into the classroom window, and that made me um, focus, and um, I had something I was good at. And it wasn't so much academics because I had trouble decoding those individual letters, and my written expression disorder was just horrible. My syntax was just atrocious, my spelling. Um, so... Um, that's, uh, that, that sport was swimming, and it carried me through high school. I was very lucky. I had incredible parents. Um, most kids don't have it as lucky as I do. And I think that's part of the reason why I'm so committed to this field. And um, that's a little bit about my, my dyslexia. Okay. So uh, I was diagnosed in, in, in later life, but uh, I'm also <laughs> dyslexic, also passionate uh, about you know, making making sure that people can – realize their potential because I believe that the dyslexic brain is not worse it's just different um, so you went through you went through the school system but obviously you, you've now got a you know an academic qualification you work in academia how how did you go from being in special ed um, I assume that's the right term in, in the US um, to 
making the transition to, you, you talked about sport being a transformative thing, but how did you then turn that around and, and, yeah. and, and begin to succeed academically? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Neil. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of support, and I think that was something that uh, made a big difference. Um, and one of the support services I received when I went to the University of Georgia, and that's where I've got my undergraduate work, and now I've got my PhD, my graduate work, um, one of the supports I, I had was actually getting all my content in accessible format. Um, I had back then, I, um, we used very large tape recorders where volunteers would tape all my books as well as other people that were in the disability clinic. And they would go through each page and read each page, and I would listen to the tones on the, um, the tape recorder, so I knew where chapter one was a beep and chapter two was a beep beep, and it was a pain. Um, but I was able to finally get that content in. I was able to, to see it and hear it at the same time. So it was that multi-sensory approach. That was huge. Access to content is access to knowledge. And um, when I had that, as well as some study, study skills and using technology, things changed for me. Uh, the tutor I had in college, I went through a special program for the first year in college, and grade point average wasn't bad. SATs was not so great, but um, I wanted to swim, and that was the key. I wanted to swim at the university level, and it kept me there, and it pushed me. And throughout the four years, it actually took me five years to get through my undergraduate because I changed my major around um, a few times. Um, I, I learned how my brain works. I learned that you know, I, I wasn't really anything wrong with my eyes or my ears. Things go into my brain. It gets scrambled a little bit. I don't connect the sounds and symbols the way like everyone else does. I do have trouble with my visual processing. I do have trouble with auditory processing. And these are the tools in which I use in order to get through my daily life. And it, not only I did well in college once I figured that all out, it was a struggle. I had to put in extra time. Like, you know, a true dyslexic, you know, it's going, you have to wake up a little earlier, maybe go to bed a little bit later. But, but with the tools, I'm able to, um, to truly, you know, get that information in my brain and retrieve it um, when I need to. And so it's, it really it made a big difference. The technology, the, the support, and getting that content in accessible format was crucial. I, I think I have to ask uh, uh, something. No, I need, I need to ask this question right now. So uh, you are telling us, telling us your story. Um, how does that work in the place where you work? Are you telling this story to the students at Charter Tech? Uh, are you telling this to help them to build their own confidence? How is that uh, your experience influence the way how you work uh, uh, on a daily basis? Oh, thank you for the question, Antonio. Um, the... Um I, I did a lot of that. I did a lot of that. When I when I graduated from, from college, my tutor and I decided to write a book called Faking It. And it was my therapeutic uh, approach of going through, you know, all that self-doubt I had going through the K-12 system. And um, I was able to work through a lot of stuff. And the book was published, and it put me on a speaking tour. Where I went around the country in the early 90s and spoke because it was one of the very first books out there um, that really took you inside the brain of someone that had a learning disability. And that was a big top – learning disabilities were big at that time, much like ADHD came later, autism is now. Um, and, and so I was all over the place. I got to hear from, from students. I got to hear from, from parents. I got to hear from teachers. And I got to really make a difference, I think, in their life from a motivational standpoint. Um, that was not enough for me. Um, that lasted. I loved it, and I, and I still love doing it. Um, however, I wanted to build something. I wanted to make the system better. I wanted systems change to happen. And I felt like I was, after a while, I felt like I was just getting a shot in the arm. I was going in, building everyone up, and then I'd walk away still knowing that there were some serious issues, no matter what they may be. In my case, I chose content accessibility um, and assistive technology as, as kind of my passion. But um, it, 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 after a while, it changed. Um, so I still do a little bit of that, but I have a team now that does that a lot of times for me, and I don't think it always needs to be my voice. Um, I've got to, I've got to build other people. I've got to build that leadership and, and other other students like I was. So, it it's been really nice. It's just been a nice transition. Christopher, I, I know that you, the AMAC is doing some amazing things, but you have been very, very engaged with the printing industry, and which we haven't really talked much about on Access Chat. So, and I, I, I'm interested in, I think it would be interesting for you to talk about that, but also about some upcoming MOOCs and what is a MOOC? I mean, I know what it is now because you taught me, but um, which, because I think that is a part of the continued journey that you're taking. I'd be happy to, Deborah, to talk about it. Um, 
the the when AMAC was started, um, and we are kind of a social justice, social entrepreneur also organization. Um, when we when we started, uh, there was a lot of state legislation going on um, in um, higher education around textbooks and ensuring that textbooks are accessible. The hard copy is accessible for someone with any type of print-related disability, whether it's dyslexia or visual impairment or blindness. And state legislation from each of the states were coming down pretty hard. In fact, that's how AMAC actually got started, was um, the University System of Georgia, which is where we're at at Georgia Tech, um, was proactive and put some money aside for a centralized center that would do post-production work, training, and technical assistance around content, but also around assistive technology. And so at that time, the, the publisher, the Association of American Publishers, which have, which have about 350 members or so, K-12 and post-secondary, they've got lobbyists in D.C. Um, they didn't want to see the same um, federal, re- uh, federal law set up that they did for K-12 back in 2004 underneath IDEA. So they were doing a feasibility study of higher education, of what would be needed, and what they felt um, one of the things that was needed was a way that disability service offices um, could actually communicate through one portal to the different publishers, because the way it worked was that each institution, there's about six, over 6,000 institutions, higher education institutions in the U.S., um, that, that they would actually go to each of the websites of the publishers and fill in all this documentation. and. The institutions didn't know when the books would come. Electronic files would come. They didn't know what format the, these files would come. Um, so they would wait around, and hopefully they would heal back from the publisher. The publishers were doing what they could from that standpoint. Um, or they would have to go to Amazon and buy the book, cut, scan, and convert it, touching all these pages. And an average page for a textbook is anywhere between 650 and 850 pages. It's a lot of touching. Um, and converting it into the format that the student needs, the learning profile of that student. Um, the, the, the publishers were frustrated and about that. So one of the things that they hired AMAC to do, and it was kind of something that we really were awarded because we had the social entrepreneur we thought like they did. Um, we were we were a organization that wasn't just academia. We were actually charging you know for our services and collecting data and research behind it. And so we set up something called Access Text, and it, it launched in 2009. On average, we received between 90,000 to 100,000 requests, which make up about 60 to 65 percent of the requests coming into post-secondary publishers for accessible files or for files, um, electronic files. The publishers that, that support us make up 92% of the marketplace. So this is a big deal. Um, this is something that, that we're really proud of. And um, because of that, that, that process, it's helped AMAC. AMAC actually does all the conversion, whereas this Access Text project is more just about provisioning which publisher to get the file from and, and will they allow us to scan it and will they, will, will they deny the file request. And keep in mind that all these houses, these publisher houses, they have um, – you know, a lot of lawyers, and they're in competition with each other. So you could just imagine the um, experience that was getting this up and going. And I'm really proud of it, actually. And it's really benefit AMAC from the standpoint because it's all about saving cost. The, the accommodations in higher education and in K-12 are outrageous. One math book can cost you in Braille, especially if it's STEM-related, anywhere between thirty to $50,000. That's a lot of money. If we can reduce that by leveraging a membership base and drawing down possibly the cost of that or tapping into prison programs, which is what we've done recently, where we actually train prisoners, there's 33 of them, we're not the only ones doing this, train prisoners about Braille, we can get it at a reduced cost compared to paying for it. So coming up with creative ways like Access Text um, or the Prison Braille Program or other areas have, has been a big, really has benefited our, our organization and it really has stepped us up and made us grow much, much quicker. I hope that answers the question. Wow. Um, yeah, it, good it, answer. <laughs> it, it's actually got me thinking about a couple more questions. Um, obviously, the print industry is an interesting one, and, and, and I've followed what's happened in the U.S. quite closely. Um, you know, I think there's, there's some very serious things happening with the Marrakesh Treaty uh, around access to... Um, yeah, you know, to, to accessible media. Um, I know that there are another couple of organisations out there that are that are busy um, working on digitising books as well. But the the thing that that struck me most was, and, and it was actually someone from Benetech that was talking about this because uh, they they do Bookshare, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with, because every 
partially in competition, I would have thought. But um, it's the fact that most of these documents are born digital. The books are created on computers. Yeah. And we take them <laughs> and we make them, take them from a format that's pretty much accessible to put them into one that's not and then refuse to convert it. We've already, the, the work's already there. So so it, it's, it's trying to get that sort of, Acknowledgement from the publishers that it's uh, if the document is born digital, it should be born accessible. Um, right. Also, I'm sure there are difficulties around the whole idea of uh, intellectual property, um, cross-border licensing agreements. Because whilst you may have an agreement in the US, you may not be able to share that file with me in the UK. Although I may have the need, and you've got permission to digitise it, it may not have permission to cross borders. But the internet is without borders, so right. um, there are all of these things that interest me. And also, from a point of view of someone being dyslexic, if I request an accessible format, someone will probably send me a plain text file. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I want I want the pictures. I want all the nice, pretty stuff. You want all the bells and whistles. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I still right. yeah, but I want it digital. I want I want to use text to speech with it, but I just don't. You know, I don't want a plain text file, which would be great if I'm a screen reader user, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so Deborah was talking about you, 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 you're working on MOOCs now. Um, these are massively multi. Yeah, you know, these are these are online courses, a bit like Coursera being a, a prime example, where people are you know able to participate in education um, outside of formal education, but but. Um, in fact, I think I've seen you on Coursera. I think you offer yeah. a course on Coursera on, on um, accessibility. Well, actually, Neil, I'm trying to, um, and this is this has been a, a challenge. And um, there was a settlement recently. You may have known from um, Department of Justice with edX regarding making their site, their MOOC site, more accessible. And edX comes from more MIT. So you've got Coursera, which is a, just another platform. Um, Coursera's got some work to do. They're moving to an on-demand platform where you could, a student can come in any time and actually take a course. They don't have to register for it and wait for a start date. Um, it can just, they can take it. They can speed the course up, slow it down. Um, so it's a, a very um, dynamic course. There's accessibility issues with it. So we've been working hard um, with Coursera. Um, the, video, the, the actual video components of all MOOC, which is an ICT, Information Communication Technology Accessibility course, the first one globally that I, that I know of, um, we, we're dying to launch. Everything's ready for it. Um, we've got the research behind it that we're going to be tracking what, what these participants are doing in their, their workplace environments to find out what, how accessibility is effect, affecting um, their workplace environment, how the course is hopefully making a difference. Um, but what's happened is that the platforms aren't fully accessible. I cannot launch an ICT accessibility course, course on an inaccessible platform. <laughs> so I am, I'm hovering. I'm hovering and I'm pushing. I'm being very proactive, and Coursera has um, has um, notified us um, out of the 11 um, checkpoints that need to be done. Nine of them will be completed in the next month and a half or so. So I'm hopeful that this this great content, this rich content that is so needed out in in especially state agencies and and, and employment, private employment. Um, Will be able to be launched, and it's six weeks. Um, actually, it's it's going to you can actually take it faster than that now with the on-demand um, platform. But it's on the foundations of of ICT. It's on the design. Uh, week number two, we're going to talk about assistive technology. And week number three, then we're going to get into um, accessible course content. How do you make um, um, content accessible? Um, and then we're going to dive into web accessibility, high high level, but but good stuff. And then at the very end, we're having someone come on and talk about how do you make your organization accessible from, from start to finish, from a high-level standpoint, obviously. But what are the trigger points? And what are the things that you need to keep in mind? Like procurement is a good example. Let's stop the bleeding by, buying in, by buy, not buying um, inaccessible products and services. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're hoping to examine. But the key is to collect that data, that research behind it, and, and Really get the information out there. Once, the, hopefully, write some publications, some white papers on it, and um, and be able to to distribute what is going on out there in in, in state government agencies and private entities. So that explains why I couldn't sign up for it then. <laughs> yes, exactly right. There, there's no date; it's to be determined on there, and it's been like that for a month. 
<laughs> I'm not losing sleep anymore, Neil, over it. I promise. <laughs> I'm just pushing. <laughs> and it's it's tremendous. It's tremendous content, Neil. Who he he interviewed leaders from all over the world and interjected them in it. And I've seen some of it, and it's great content. But as as Dr. Lee says. He cannot put out courses on accessibility on inaccessible platforms, even though many, many other people do, but the standards are very high um, coming from AMAC, and so they're just not going to do it. But it's a shame because we all want to get to this content, but, you know, it has to be accessible. So it's yeah. frustrating. Thank you, saying that. Yeah, I will, I will say, though, and Deborah highlighted this, uh, we, did, we did interview experts. But we've intertwined the experts throughout. Um, in addition, we have true stories or, or real voices of individuals with disabilities that we've intertwined through each of the the modules with, within um, the course. So it's really we really didn't want to get we didn't want to have a course where we were just teaching a course. We wanted to have it to be really alive and dynamic with true stories um, of how. Some of the barriers are around ICT accessibility for individuals with disabilities. So I'm, I'm real proud of it, and it's a it's a good it's a good first step if we can just get it launched. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 really hoping that you do. Uh, I'll be sending lots of my uh, my colleagues your way. Great, great. Uh, we'll need it. We'll, Open space can be popular. Yeah, I, I and, think and, it will. And it's free. The, these courses will be free. Free. Yeah. Everybody will be able. You know, everybody will be able to access them for free. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I know how much effort goes into this because I've looked into it. I've created training for internally around awareness and, and, and so on, and Antonia has been involved in creating training. It's not, it's not a, a short process. No, no, uh, it was, it's an ordeal. It really is. It's very, very expensive. In fact, there's some, some studies come out. I mean, we only, we, we only received, we received under thirty thousand to actually produce it. The time um, we got all done is way over $100,000 to to make this, to get the studio time and videotape everything and the staff involved in it. Um, really, well, I, have, I have seven instructors tied to this. That That's how committed we are about making sure that we're bringing experts in that really know the knowledge and not just bring one instructor in to do a, a, a sweep of ICT accessibility. It's, you can't do that anymore. Um, well, it's such a big topic and there's so many specific areas. So. You know, I, I noticed you've got people like Bill Curtis Davidson on, on there and, and so on, and you've got a, a wide range. Uh, I'm assuming he's doing a maturity model? Yes, you, you, you assume right. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but yes, he is, since you brought it up. And I understand that you had Frances West on a couple weeks ago that, from IBM, yeah. and she did a great job. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan yes. of maturity models. Um, we've actually got Susan Scott Parker from the Business Disability Forum coming on, and, and the, the BDF um, Technology Task Force were, were led the way in the idea of creating accessibility maturity models. Right. So, so um, it's, it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about because I believe that that's the way that you get executive engagement because they understand right. maturity models. You, you, what a lot of the time we do is we talk about accessibility in the terms of accessibility and that's a turn off we need to yeah. be talking about it in the language of the people that we're addressing exactly exactly and i think that's happening i don't know if you're seeing that but when you go to some of the accessibility conferences now the the companies are there and the presentations are it's slowly and surely shifting to more about you know it, you know how we're going to afford this how we're going to you know, make this happen from a business standpoint um it's 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 quite exciting it's an exciting time that we're in yeah. Uh, are you preparing, are you going to prepare any sort of launch for this? No, putting everybody together, for doing a, a sort of a public presentation about the core objectives? You know, that's a great idea, Antonio. I hadn't really thought of it from that standpoint. Maybe Deborah can help me out with that. But um, we, we are going to be doing something. I think we're going to, uh, the accessibility is the key on this. Um, obviously, it makes me very nervous. Um, so that, that's been primarily up front. Um, we've done a trailer video that's tied to it. Um, once we uh, feel comfortable with the accessibility aspect and, and launch it, um, after a couple of weeks have gone by and it's, and it's really a, a positive experience, and I'm knocking on wood now, um, we'll, we'll definitely have a more um, 
um, international launch forward. We are um, and we're underneath the College of Architecture, at Georgia Tech, and Design, and our music school actually, you know, had 22,000 in their MOOC last summer, which is pretty impressive. So we we hope to be around those numbers, and so we'll we'll be doing some outreach and marketing. Um, definitely, that's that's, imp that's impressive numbers. I think. It's it, it's great to get in that 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 base level of understanding and, and and the fact that you're going to have real people talking about their experiences is is really important. We need that empathy because accessibility as a topic, as a technical topic, is very dry. Yeah, um, <laughs> say the least. Yeah, it is very dry. <laughs> I like it though. I don't know why. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> oh yeah, but I can't expect everyone to be have the same you know, same kind of passion, you know. I, uh, um, I I can't expect my wife to be as excited about it as I am, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, so um, so I I think that um, very very. Very excited about that. Uh, I'm very excited about MOOCs. I'm very excited about teaching people. Um, where do you see that going next? Once you've got the accessible platform, are you going to go deeper? Yes, yes, we are going to go deeper. And we're going to not um, reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of really great stuff already that has been developed over the last decade in this area. There's a lot of organizations doing some incredible things. You know, you know, friends in Spain are doing some stuff. The UK's got stuff going on, specifically around procurement, some of the wizards that they've got set up. Um, Canada's doing some, some great stuff. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to, and the U.S., there's, there's groups here that are doing some really great things. IWAP is doing some, some really good stuff regarding certification. So um, we're going we're gonna to try to pull everything together and, and go a little bit deeper. Um, Georgia Tech is a research um, institution. I'd, I'd like to be at the forefront of that and tap into what's happening out there in this area. I, I see um, Georgia Tech's got easily alone, when you mentioned it at the very beginning, um, of the Skype call that, that we've got six or seven different labs doing some very innovative stuff. Um, I want to pull those groups in. So we're going to see how this goes, um, lay a foundation, uh, show there's a need, show that there's a student base that we can draw on, um, and then maybe run it through um, our colleges, a college here, whether it's the architecture college or another college on campus. And we also have a very strong um, professional education group here that we can start off looking at certifications um, and go that route too. Um, but again, the, the first thing is to do is to get this launched and see what kind of response we get from it. Excellent. Deborah, do you have any final questions before we close? Well, I, I will uh, comment as opposed to a question. Okay. I, um, of course, I work a lot in the United States and internationally. And the thing that, Christopher knows this, but the thing that has impressed me so much about what Georgia Tech is doing, um, and specifically his AMAC program, is that they don't really see anybody as competitors. You mentioned, you know, Benetech, and yeah, they don't see any, they really don't, because they are, they're winning tons of grants and attention and, and work, and they really, working very closely with them, I know that they they got a lot on their plate, but they are really coming about this from a way that I haven't seen any other university do anywhere in the United States and globally. And so I think that they, the innovative approach that they're taking from the social enterprise, social good, I, I think it's it's really, truly going to change. change. It's going to change everything. And so that's one reason why I'm really proud to be, you know, associated with the team. But they don't really look at others and say, oh, your competitors, we're not going to share. They share everything. So, and also, Neil, this is not just a U.S. conversation. You know, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, Dr. Lee knows about what you are doing over there with EDF and Susan Scott Parker. And, you know, we, we need to capture everything that's happening and we're working hard at it. But I think this is the way to truly move us all forward. So I, I've, I'm, I'm really impressed with, um, I'm very impressed with Christopher's leadership skills, and I embarrass him like that all the time, but I really am. So, <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate the comments, and, and you know, and, and there's so much work that needs to be done. I mean, you know, just in all busy times, we can receive from a course content standpoint 500 textbooks in a week. Um, we need more bookshelves. We need more learning allies. We need more AMAX out there. And collectively, we need to work together. I mean, to solve this problem, it's a big problem, and um, these publishers need our help. And um, 
And I think um, I think there's a lot of great work being done from the federal government in the U.S. that's pushing some of that from a funding standpoint. And um, and but I do I do appreciate the comments, Deborah. Thank you. And can I say one more thing? Um, and I'm going to direct these a little bit at Neil and Antonio. Neil and Antonio both work for ATOS, which is a you know multi-billion dollar corporation that has employees all over the world, including many in the United States. And one thing that Dr. Lee's doing is, and I'm hoping other universities, they need to do the research and tell the stories. What is ATOS doing and why are y'all involved in this conversation and what can we learn from the corporations? So we we desperately need the research and that, that's another reason why I think it's valuable that they're in the conversations. They need to know what's happening so they can brag about the corporations because a lot of work's being done but it's being done in a vacuum in many places. It's certainly done behind the scenes. Yep. A lot of, yep. a lot of companies don't talk about what they do. Um, and, 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 and also, I, I, while I, I, I understand you know, you're very collaborative, I, actually, I, I also believe in co-opetition. That's why, although you know, I work for a big IT outsourcer, we're quite happy to welcome Francis West on. You know, it's... The, the 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 challenge that we face is big enough, and as you quite rightly say, it gives everyone enough room to grow. Um, yeah. Actually, it needs more people. We need to welcome yeah. more competition into the market, but also collaboration. So, so some of the stuff that we're doing um, actually is bringing together huge businesses to collaborate around procurement. Um, so maybe we'll have that conversation because we are. Yeah. We are actually helping change the market. We're, we're changing the views of huge multi-billion corporations about the need because we're telling them that there's demand uh, and it's, it's a demand-led conversation that we're having, um, which, which I think is, is something that's not happened before because we've all approached things individually and it's only through the power of the collective that, that we're really beginning to see that uh, and uh, out successfully. And we, we all work for different companies and different projects, but in the end, you know, we all try to inv evangelize the groups that we are that are around us. So uh, that challenge is common to all of us. So even you know, uh, even with, with Francis, she has her own issues around her own work environment. We have our own. You have yours. They were so it's it's part of something bigger. Yep, great. So I think we've run over slightly, but that's because it's an interesting conversation. So uh, thank you very much once again. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you. And look I've enjoyed forward, it. Look forward to tweeting with you tomorrow night. Sounds great. Tomorrow night it is. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, y'all. Thank you.